We just looked at a consequentialist approach to ethics, something that looks at the outcome. We're now going to turn to a really different approach to ethics, a deontological approach to ethics, where uh, we decide whether something's ethical or not, irrespective of the outcome. Okay, so it's quite a different approach to ethics. One of the most uh, famous, probably, approaches to this is that developed by Immanuel Kant, and it deals with uh, his decision that, or, well, the basic idea that someone could work out whether an act was ethical or not, logically by themselves. And to do this, he came up with a test which decides whether or not you can meet the categorical imperative. So that's basically the idea. What we have to do is to decide whether the act itself is ethical, irrespective of the outcomes. So if we're going to judge something based upon the categorical imperative, we need to understand how does it meet this categorical imperative? What actually is the test to be used? Eckhart actually had three form formulations, and we're going to deal with the first two. So if something's going to be ethical, it needs to have universal acceptability, or universality is a way some people uh, would term it. So that means that an act can only be ethical where you would act the same time all the time, right? So it's universal. The second formulation was, was that you must treat humanity or you must treat other people with respect. You can't treat them as a means to an end. You've got to actually treat them with respect. The third formulation, which we don't deal with, is also that you're not responsible for others' ethical acts. You're, you're your own moral king or queen. But those first two are what we're going to concentrate on. So Kant's approach requires us to start by uh, thinking about a maxim or a, a kind of general rule that would develop from the behavior that we're thinking about. So we develop this maxim and then we apply those tests that we've been talking about, universality and respect. So formulating the maxim is the first critical step that we need to take uh, if we're going to use this, uh, this approach. Once we have this maxim or this approach and we universalize it, so we take it from the very specific action to a general rule, then we work out whether there's a contradiction in conception or a contradiction in will. This is the way we work out whether something meets the universality test. So a contradiction in conception occurs when the maxim doesn't make sense. It's self-defeating or it's illogical. Okay, uh, That's a really important point. So for instance, if uh, lying was okay, then truth would be meaningless. Okay, So it's illogical. The rule becomes illogical. A contradiction in will is slightly different. That's where the maximize might not be illogical or it might not be self-defeating or, con or contradictory. It just might be somewhere where people wouldn't want to live. It would lead to the kind of world that people uh, wouldn't want to be part of. Okay, So they're the two tests. Is there a contradiction in conception or a contradiction in will? They're subsets of the universality test, the first formulation of the categorical imperative. The second formulation of the categorical imperative says that we can't treat humans as a means to an end. We can't use people. Okay. Treating them as a means or, or, or getting something off them is okay as long as they're treated as an ends as well, as long as we treat them well and they're getting something out of it. This applies to uh, all humans, so it's not just a special group, it's about humanity. Why don't we deal with a specific example uh, which might help us understand uh, this approach to ethics a little bit differently. Imagine we've got someone who wants to borrow some money but he knows he won't be able to pay it, pay it back. So is it okay to borrow that money knowing full well that you can't pay it back? And in fact, you're probably lying, at least implicitly lying, that you can't pay it back when you take the loan. Our first step is to formulate a maxim or a statement that describes the action. So the specific maxim here that describes the behavior is, okay, when I believe I need money, I'll borrow it, and promise to pay it back even though I know I can't. Okay, so that's the specific behavior that he has. 
the next step we need to take is to universalize that. So that means take the specific, make it general. So rather than about you, it's about anyone. When anyone believes they need money, they'll borrow it and promise to pay it back, although they know they can never do so. So now there becomes a question. Is there a contradiction in conception or a contradiction in will? Is this, does this meet the test of universality? Is there a contradiction? Well, yes. I mean, if we applied that maxim, if that became the rule, right, then the idea of borrowing money would not make any sense at all. If you never have to pay money back, then borrowing is nonsensical. It's irrational. Okay? And so we have a contradiction in conception, and it doesn't meet the categorical imperative because it's breached this one condition. So remember, you only need to breach one of these formulations and it becomes unethical. So this is an unethical act. Even though we uh, don't need to go through all the formulations because we have that contradiction, we can see also, though, that it would be a breach of the second formulation of respect. I mean, if you've got uh, no, uh, no, uh, uh, no inkling of paying this money back, then you aren't treating the person who you're borrowing it from with any respect. So you're treating them as a means to the ends to get your money, not worried about the fact that they're going to be done with out, of, out, out of their money. So again, it, it breaches that second formulation as well as the first in this instance. One of the ideas behind Kant was that um, all of the different formulations of the problem um, should be given the same answer. So really, what, what does that mean? His general approach is that there's no exceptions. And you could have a look at that, at the classic Kant's, uh, Kant's axe, axe problem that we have a link to here to explain some of the difficulties that uh, that can entail. If you've had a look at that video, what you'll see is that uh, Kant can be very strict and it often runs counter to our moral intu intuitions and really uh, it, it, it just sometimes doesn't feel right. Okay, So if you've got a murderer at your door, should you lie to them to help someone out? You know, Kant's going to say no if, uh, and, and that really doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Note also, it doesn't help us when we have a conflict of duties, okay? So I ought not to lie and I ought not to let someone be killed. So it doesn't really help us with these conflicting duties. And so some dilemmas, um, it might be difficult if we apply it literally as Kant set it out. Once again, I'll hope you'll have a go at applying these uh, Kant's ideas to some problems. It's only when you apply it to the problems that you can start to see how difficult it is. And it will, it will really help you as you prepare for, that, uh, for the assessment item. So um, there you have it. We've gone through those ethical actions. We've introduced ethics. We've thought about a consequentialist approach where we make an ethical decision based upon the outcome. We've got uh, ethical egoism and we've got consequentialism to help us with that. And we've also look at Kant's approach to get a deontological approach to ethics. Um, hopefully that started to give you some different ways of looking at these ethical dilemmas and also some help uh, for that assessment item coming up.